Hi, Mage fans. This is Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast, and before this week's episode on jamming Trinity Continuum Ether into Mage, I have some notes. M20 Sorcerer is now available on Drive-Thru RPG and is available through the link in the show notes. Using that link to buy it does support the show, and we thank everyone who's done that. This book is a 120-page or so look at Sorcerer and updates linear magic for M20 and generally seems to tidy things up, which I appreciate. We'll be doing an author interview in the upcoming week, and we'll be adding it to the queue of Tomes of Magic once the print-on-demand copy is available. If you grab it now during the preview window, you'll get it the PDF immediately and later receive a coupon to discount the POD copy so you won't be paying extra to have it earlier. If you want a print-on-demand band copy later. If you've been playing with the Midjourney image generation tool, we've added a Midjourney channel and bot to the Meets the Podcast Discord, and I've been doing daily prompts. If you want some inspiration or want to toy around with Midjourney, join us at discord.me slash mates the podcast. There are a few other projects coming up that I'm excited to talk about once I can, but until then, today's episode does contain mild swearing as well as one or two references to folkloric stories involving people boinking demons. So if that's not your cup of tea, know that there's a little bit of that around the middle of the episode. On with the show. Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson, with Mage the Podcast. And today we are discussing steampunk and Martians and other things that should be in your mage game, possibly, and rewriting history and good mechanics for changing them. Did I mention Martians? Uh, we are discussing Trinity Continuum Aether, which is currently on Kickstarter, link in the show notes, with someone who speaks both fluent Trinity Continuum and fluent Mage the Ascension. My guest is uh, Kim Godwin. She is one of the authors on Trinity Continuum, as well as the upcoming Mage book. I don't remember its name, but it talks about the Disparates. Forgotten Ones and Forbidden Orders. Does it actually contain forbidden orders? Orders you uh, can't be a part of? I don't know what the extra stuff was so i'm not sure what else because uh i only got to read my part of the book so that is entirely reasonable and we look forward to talking to you about that when it's closer to coming out because i'm excited for that book to be out in the world because we've never really gotten detailed coverage of the crafts and i just look at that book and i'm go this is eight episodes i'm very excited for this <laughs> <laughs> so you started with horror reviews, horror writing, made your way over. You discovered the horror of mage, or the horror of writing for mage, um, and then you moved over to Trinity Continuum. So what what is Aether as a book and a project? Aether, of course, is the newest incarnation of the Trinity Continuum. It, it starts the game in 1895 when things have been going on for a little bit. So we're in the Victorian era in 1895, and the characters that you know from most public domain fiction are real so are their authors and then this the sequence of events isn't quite what you re might remember people aren't quite who they you might know them as there's a possible scientific explanation for it that doesn't seem plausible and by the way uh aliens have dropped down world of world style and have been destroying the planet so now we have all these groups that are trying to deal with this weird stuff happening on. So you have some steampunk elements, you have some weird science stuff going on, you have some horror and especially body horror stuff going on. Because what happens when you've been messing with Aether, Aether for too long is that it can become an addiction. You have to be, you lose control of yourself because you're overindulging. And that's one, one way of looking at it. And then there you have the people that go too far with Aether or they've been changed by Aether in such a way, or they no longer think that they're on the same level as humanity, or people are scared of them because they physically have changed so much that it's not what some people recognize. We deal a little bit with colonialism, but we're mostly focused on an, a sense of exploration, discovery, and invention. What can we do with this? We now have this thing. We've discovered this new substance. What can we do with it? So to break this down, you have the discovery, invention, or realization of this thing that is in the world, and it is called Aether. Is that a natural resource? Is it something a person discovers? Is it one of those things that has always been there? What is it narratively? Thinking about this in, in the made sense, it's something that transforms you. Do you think we should have quintessence toxicity? Do you think it's one of those things where if you spend too much time at a node that that should start changing you? Mages are notable because they are remarkably resilient to their magic affecting them in a lot of cases unless the storyteller decides mm -hmm. to to mechanize that outside of the paradox system and a little bit quiet. What is Aether? Where does it come from? And does that mutation affect? Is that something that you think we could be stealing for mage? One of the many, many optional rules for mage is having 
quintessence affinity. Like in Vampire, if you drink a certain type of blood, that gives a certain effect. If you drink from a lot of melancholy people, it, that you, you can use that to power your disciplines in, in Vampire. So that's an optional rule where it's like, well, what's the emotion that's tied to that energy that you're pulling in? Or what, what were you feeling when you were casting that? Why are you casting it? And if you're storing quintessence, what's the essence of the quintessence? And if you got to a certain point where you've spent too much quintessence of a certain type, it leaves a soul scar. It changes your pattern. For this, the answer that I have, what is aether? Aether is a form of the th of fifth element or scientific process not understood until scientists and inventors such as Tesla found find ways to create devices fueled by it, synthesize it into medicines, otherwise utilize it as fuel. Matthew describes it as liquid lightning. Because in the opening fiction of the book, we talk about Tesla saw that it could power lights without anything else, but on its own, it's kind of inert. It just exists. It's, it glows green, but it doesn't do anything on its own until you start using it for something. So kind of like Quint, Quint just exists, and yeah. you don't, it doesn't do anything until you act upon it. So you've mentioned the Magog type gifts. Who are the people that are employing it, and do they kind of have different ways of doing so? Uh, yes. So we have uh, squires who, if you think about it, they're kind of influencing Aether to do a thing for them. It's it's okay. almost like luck abilities. So like someone with affluence with entropy. So they're kind of manipulating chances so they can get more successes mechanically. They can they more often succeed when they use their gifts, whereas Gogs use devices to influence it, whereas Mago Magogs kind of have an internalized process that if they lean too much into certain gifts, it can transform them in a certain way. But there's a way to to de-escalate their state of being in, back down to a Gog or a Squire. So we have Squires, and we could introduce this into our game seemingly in one of two ways. Squires have access to using devices powered by either this Scream Sorcerer Extraordinary Citizen Cousteau to me. Someone Wonders like, and... Yeah. Wonders. Um, they can use a talisman. They don't have the ability to use an artifact. But also they have the ability to kind of harness these narrative powers of, of spectacular luck. These daredevils, these lucky guesses, and so on. And I very much like the idea of that being something that the corona of characters around a mage could have access to. That at some latent level, mortals do gain the ability to in some way harness or utilize quintessence if it's been appropriately prepared. And they get to, to, to fudge things a little bit. They get to be the sidekick that's not quite as cool as the main person, but has uh, a little extra buoying them up when uh, the giant robot foot comes down down and they're able to miss it narrowly or the the roof collapses they have that moment of of Holmesian deduction that a normal person wouldn't get then you have this much more ominously named Gog and Magog character types I, I know they have something to do with kind of this process of internalizing Aether what are they yeah so Squires are more modifying probability Gogs are modifying the world around them through their knowledge whereas Magogs are modifying themselves mm. through to achieve monstrous effects. You had mentioned that all the all of the public domain characters we have come to know and love to having Universal try and do multi-billion dollar franchises and failing based on that, thanks Dark Universe Reboot. Are there any historical characters or fictional characters that we can kind of line up to these? Like, is it one of those things like Sherlock Holmes is a squire and Dr. Jekyll is a Magog or anything like that, just to kind of get that in our heads? Of course, Squires, Dr. Watson, definitely Sherlock Holmes. I could pro I would also argue that uh, Helsing, Dr. Van Helsing would be a squire. We could also talk about, let's see, the Invisible Man is something that we, somebody we've specifically named as being a gog. Same okay. thing with Dr. Dr. Jekyll is okay. also a gog. And the gogs would be like Dorian Gray, Elizabeth Bothry, who's also historical, and then uh, Dracula. So like these people... And they're, uh, the people that inspired him are still existing. So if you want, where uh, the his with Dracula especially, because the history of Vlog Tepish and the story of Dracula, the vampire, are kind of blended together as mm -hmm. because of Bram Stoker. But Bram Stoker is still around. We talk about Jules Verne being in existence as well as uh, Captain Nemo. I'm not sure if we put Captain Nemo anywhere. I'd have to check in the other chapters to see where they pepper around. And of course, Wilhelmina Harker is like, is she a gog? Is she a mugog? Is she a vampire right now? Uh, I talk about her trying to cure her vampiric curse. So yeah, she's got that ability, but she's not a vampire. It's, it's kind of weird. Yeah, it, this yeah. takes us in a couple interesting directions. One is we can say, hey, 
Aether, just Quintessence. And if you want to jam this into your game, you can have mortals that have started to play around with it. And maybe you have someone who is selling health supplements. Little do they know that it's slowly mutating them because the node that they are gathering it from is uh, subtly tainted with like heavy metals or something like that. We also have the direction that maybe this is a new phenomenon, that something has happened in the Umbra, Quintessence is falling out of nodes, and it is trapping a little bit of the psycho-reactivity of the other world and now mortals are coming in contact with that. And maybe it's something that mages don't have the ability to play around with. In the same way mages can't really learn sorcery, they are used to interfacing when, with quintessence in this particular way, so they lose access to this. But there are these mortals that are slowly figuring it out, and mages are trying to put a lid on it or, or what have you. You present an interesting case that there are historical precedents to it, and I really like the idea that any time we get another way to justify the existence of something that really looks like a vampire that doesn't come down to emo on we and Kane. I think that's a win for mage. So just the idea that historically these types of creatures may not have existed in the world or they were born of Aether, this material that has kind of fallen through maybe the Umber or something like that or fallen out of the Maya, where previously there weren't vampires, now there are because of people are dealing with this and using that archetype to kind of change themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, in history, before this period, there are vampires, there are revenants, there are monsters in mythology and mm -hmm. urban folklore. Like I mentioned, referenced the uh, Beast of Gar Garavan. We don't know what it was, but it was rampaging and it was killing people and somebody was dispatched to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And the killing stopped. When we talk about mage being people's beliefs make things real, especially when we're talking about the Umbra mm -hmm. or what chicken and the egg sort of stuff. Uh -huh. Right. Because we have hieroglyphics. We have cave paintings of creatures that don't exist. We have some really bad medieval paintings of, of animals that <laughs> should that we know exist, but don't look like that. Like different types of illnesses that are that kind of contribute to that sort of vampiric myth. There's one story in Japan around this one sh shrine. It's basically the shrine of the still phallus. And the local legend is stay with me. A woman was approached to be a lover of a demon and she, or an oni, and she said no. And so the demon's like, well, fuck you, and then decided to resign inside of her. You know what I'm getting at? And he just bit off the penis of any of her other lovers. And it was such a big problem that she went to the shrine and prayed, and they gave her this holy steel phallus and broke the demon's teeth, and now it's enshrined. And it's still enshrined. And now in modern interpretation, it is people pray there for successful childbirth. Sex workers go there for good sexual health. So people are attributing that, that story to syphilis or in other STDs. Whereas like vampirism gets attributed to tuberculosis, it gets attributed to different sorts of allergies, hemophilia. But that is a no shit vampirism story in the 1890s that had a completely logical explanation that people attributed to the mythology. So did Aether create vampires or did they exist before? And or do we not ex did we not understand what they were? It's like the narwhal horn. Did unicorns exist before the narwhal? Or did the narwhal just feed into that as a way to ethically source unicorn horns? I like the idea of the narwhal being the way to sustainably har harvest unicorn horns. <laughs> I also like the idea that, what was it? Unicorns are just rhinoceroses with a lower armor class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like this because Aether gives us an avenue to say, in Mage, we frequently have the idea of bygones, where it's like, no, 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 this dragon did exist. It's not here anymore. But now we have the idea of Aether being psychoreactive or going through people who have a strong tie to these legends. And suddenly, no, dragons never existed until now. Like, uh, uh, hopping vampires didn't exist until now. Kilin did not exist in the world until now. And I, I very much like this as an avenue to kind of flip the script on the way Mage traditionally has that. Are there any entities in Aether that represent that? Or are all people that interface with Aether like people it depends like some of the art that's come out from the art book like one of my favorite ones is the multi-eyed multi-armed creature with the stalks and like the weird 
predator mouth, but except it's not like a predator mouth. It's all fleshy and it's got like ringed with teeth. It's like one of my favorite t- types of monsters in the mm-hmm. hand and the tongue. It's like a um, proboscis, cause it, but it's also like kind of fanged. And it's like, that's not a person. Uh, did this At least not anymore. Yeah. It's like, did this start as a person? Is this something that was kind of pulled through an aether grate from another reality, from another dimension? You know, were those arms ethically sourced? Was someone trying to experiment with, like, re- replacing a limb, and then it just kind of went out, they they just botched the role, and it just kind of went awry? What, what happened there? Like, something like that I would see as, oh my god, that's a Magog. I think Magogs could be something completely monstrous, or it could just be a person. It depends on, like... Two things that came up. One, you previously made mention of ether gates. What are those? And then let's talk about aliens. So the ether gates are a lot of fun. In the write-up for uh, the students of Tesla, I said that one of the earliest experiments for aether gates accidentally opened a gate inside of a person. Awkward. So these are gateways that can go connect to other worlds, other realities, like other worlds as in like within the Earth or other planets. Okay. And you can go through them, and there's a certain duration for some of them. Like in the uh, Mercer Correspondence chapter, she talks about one gateway only being open for 30 seconds. So if they didn't go back through it, they'd be stuck. So it's like you're using a device, to, an Aether, to open a portal into things so you could always to, to stargate it. And that's an easy uh, mage parallel because you do corresp- high-level correspondence things to open doorways to places that shouldn't be where you teleport. The interesting thing to me, though, is that these are, uh, it's it's seemingly as described, these are natural phenomena. These are things that are happening. People don't necessarily build ether gates. They they occur. Um, Is that the case, or is it something that someone intentionally builds? The the other thing is the ultimate reality thing. Yes, the the answer is both. Okay, Okay, cool. Uh, Because we have some, yeah, we have some naturally. People figure, uh, maybe figure out how Mm -hmm. how to do it themselves. Yeah, I referenced the Erdstall tunnels, the gremlin holes, which are actually a thing all over Europe where they just kind of tunnels that no one knows how they got there. They just are there and they don't know how well they're connected or where they go. And people they usually get to be too small or people run out of oxygen before they can get very far in them. You start talking about uh, Celtic mythology, you start talking about the people of the mounds, the OSSC. Where it's like the you start talking about Fomori and you start talking about the the people of Tuatha Dé Danann, uh, and you start getting into weird theories about like the Tuatha Dé being beings that came from sky ships down, and then the Fomori being subterranean people. So it's like weird underworld has always been a, like a strange place that led to different places. Greek mythology was that way too. Where how do you get to Hades? You go through that that cave. It's right there. So the other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, in Mage, it is highly non-trivial to jump to another reality, as it were. We have the idea of Everett volumes, and that is a high-level correspondence entropy life thing. I find it interesting that the spheres involved are remarkably similar to those going into the underworld. Let's not stare too much at that. What are the in-game ramifications to these Aether Gates that go to seemingly other realities? And how is that something you, th- you feel like we could pull into Mage? Well, in our uh, Rules of Aether chapter, we do talk about going into these special environments where we provide rules that's also like story hooks. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, this is this realm that does this thing. And while you're here, it inflicts this sort of complication or this sort of effect on you as a person. There's a danger, of course, going into to a world where you don't have something that gives you oxygen and you decompress and you die. But doing that as a game mechanic is kind of a dick move as yeah. a GM. So that's kind of interesting. What What is the thing that would compel someone to go through then an ether gate? I like the idea that the ether gates in this case are these weird phenomenon where enough ether is coalesced. It has met with either some bit of technology or some bit of folk belief about an area being connected to another place. And suddenly we have this new category of umbral realms that has opened up or shallow realms. Best rando mechanic that was never used again. Thank you, Dead Magic Volume 2. Um, so, uh, so why are people going through them? I, I imagine a fair part of that is spirit of adventure. So down for the, like the, the, the O's, uh, I forget how, how it's pronounced in Portuguese for that society, because they're being funded by the military, the Brazilian government for the, by their military, as well as by the Vatican, the, the Vatican's intelligence service, the entity, the potential of Aether Gates to transport people from place to place if you can control it 
like the logistics and the cost. Now, in 1890s, we're just now starting to see like beginnings of cars, but we're still going around by carriage. Hot air balloons are a thing. And some of the early blimp stuff are starting to be abundant. But otherwise, you get around the world by walking, by horse, or by ship. And that is expensive. It's time consuming. So the appeal of applying military funding to figure out a way, no matter how weird or mystical or scientific it could be, to go through those gates to a place that you decide and come out the other side alive and intact with all of your stuff is really appealing. With the travelers, they're focused more on, besides getting that sort of funding, they're looking at archaeological sites, right? So opening gates in those locations to go to an alternate realm to document what's actually happening at that location at a different point in time. Uh, The big thing that people are always looking for that funded a lot of expeditions down to South America was the search for El Dorado. They're looking for the city of gold. So what happens when you find El Dorado? You find the city of gold and you're able to take its riches through the Aethergate with you back to modern times, whatever that may be. There's a lot of greed involved with that, as well as exploration. There's a lot of good cultural things, because it's like, I want to reconnect with what happened there. I want to know. So there is that knowledge of explanation. There is also a practical thing where it's like, transportation, who hasn't wanted to just teleport to where they wanted to go? God, I don't want to be stuck in traffic again. For me to fly from Bahrain back to the States, it's a 23-hour flight, and it's not direct. I think under M20 rules, each three hours in the air deals one point of bashing damage. Is this something that normies know about in the session, in the game, or is this something that only high-level governments and so on? Who Who is in on this, on the existence of Ether and so on? So the esoteric order of Aeons with their journals and stuff like that and their, their papers, they're trying to introduce these concepts and things to the world at large. Okay. They're trying to let the world know that this stuff exists. It's happening. Whether or not people believe it, How many people are actually literate? That's a good Uh question there. Kind of doing like a World's Fair expedition. Here's this brand new technology. Here are all the wonders that we can bring to you. And then people pick up the paper and they believe it or they don't. I do like, though, to translate that into mage, that we now have a new battleground for the notion of unbelief, that these etheric phenomenons are not immune to it. That if the scrutiny of society at large is brought down on this weird creature that you find or this etheric gate, it will collapse if you were to send out a TikTok of it, enough people going, that's bullshit, would literally from a distance cause it to be crushed. So you're either in the position of building up a group of people that believe in it and have interacted with it and also keeping it secret. And suddenly we have a diegetic reason uh, within the game that this is kind of being concealed. But so this is part of kind of a milieu of this being a, a, an age of unbelievable wonder. And some of this is obviously poppycock. So it's still going to be those mm-hmm. cases where it's like, yes, this weird thing did happen. But Philip Randolph Hearst still managed to just make up stuff about it and then fight a war with well, Spain. But we also have the concept of winding and unwinding reality, which is we have a workable like time travel mechanic. So you undo events where it's like high level time magic, where you can only go one direction in time in as far as mage is concerned. You can't really travel back and forth in time. You can't have like a TARDIS. You can't have a TARDIS moment. What is this winding, unwinding uh, mechanic? Because uh, in mage, a mage has the ability to change the world, but it's real hard. Mages, one of the things we really don't have is time travel is remarkably punishing and changing anything large scale is remarkably difficult. It seems like one of the core ideas behind Aether is that uh, some manifestations of it have the ability to rewrite kingdoms. It just takes a, lo- takes a lot longer. Like the one fiction was talking about, we, we'd worked on this for decades to completely eradicate the Meiji restoration we, we we were able to rewrite that to go back to the way it was but then the martians came and fucked it all up so we have like a little sidebar talking about spinning or unwinding where it's more when the get gift is a spinning or unwinding it's more narrative but it's like strength strengthening building or reinforcing things so like undoing damage or going back a few seconds so it 
depending on how crunchy I guess you want it to be as a storyteller or especially how people do it it's like well do you rewind time by doing like the scarlet witch thing from the movies where you're doing like weird hand puppetry or are you like actually like cranking a watch rolling it back type of thing i like the idea uh, as a storyteller being able to give that sort of time frame hey when you unwind it it goes back this far it's like you can only rewind back to a certain amount of times and that as a storyteller also saves your brain when players are like, okay, I'm going to roll my time effect and I am going to completely rewind back to the beginning of the day. So now as a storyteller, I have to create a divergent path and I have to completely redo everything. I just invalidated everything that I did, all my players did for the day. It wasn't a bad dream. It happened, but only one person knows the truth. Mm -hmm. And now we're back to the beginning and now the choices are going to change. But with that knowledge, do you decide as a storyteller that now that they know and they take those steps, what new branches do you open up? But the important part is it kind of gives us these large scale structures. And you had made mention of this group that is trying to do something involving the AG, Meiji restoration that has been happening for decades. So it is safe to say that there could be secret groups that are trying to unwind various aspects of what the world is doing, which gives us two things that we love in Mage. Giant effects and people secretly doing a thing that your characters can kind of mess around with. But the important part to me also is mechanically it has advice on how to do it. And it's not like oh, yeah. for months me the cursed where it's just like this is how time travel works for you this is how to deal with time travel and massive time changes within a game and it goes for pages it's not like a sidebar where it's like oh, yeah, you yeah. might want to consider this that is yeah. something that is interesting to you it is it's in here yeah in the fiction and stuff we also talk about hey we we unwound the sinking of this this ship bringing it back up and people are now alive again but they don't remember what happened so now there's this big blank spot in their minds, in their history. How do you explain this ghost ship, the ship coming from nowhere? And then you've completely erased that, the impact of those events from the people, their families, because now they're alive. Yeah. They never sank. So now you have these branches of reality that don't go anywhere. So if you're going with, depending on what time travel theory you want to abide by, where you have multiverse theory, which is what Continuum, I think, really is, is by unwinding... Tra traveling back in time, you create a divergent path. So now you have created a new reality where that event didn't happen. And what happens when you do that enough times? Who are you really? Uh, with like the Order of Murder, with the Black Keys, they specifically go into different realities and murder the target. <laughs> And to me, that's where the mage stuff comes in. We're like, what is the moral ramifications of being able to unwind time and suddenly uncreating or um, spawning into existence a bunch of people who under other circumstances wouldn't have existed? Because people are like, the, t the trolley problem is too easy. What if we add time travel to it? So they're, they're Then you create other problems, right? <laughs> yeah. You have mentioned a couple times aliens. Can we talk about that for a bit? Mage, love the game, gave us the Zigrogler. The uh, the Dweller Beyond Time, gave us the Ramas Ka, gave us the Cephalids Maleficae, gave us the Kaluan, gave us Kuvan, and gave us two sorceress groups involving aliens. So to me, Mage is really the only group that is pulling the banner of, yeah, sure, aliens in the world of darkness. So I'm always interested in adding to it. Kim, what the dink are the Martians? So with the Martians, there are a few different things that you can speculate on. So one of the theories is that they are people from another planet that are coming to harvest the Aether on this planet. Some people think that maybe we're dealing with a chicken and an egg problem. Like someone went through an Aether gate at some point, some reality, got stuck on Mars, created a new civilization, and now have come back or something like that. So there's like different like speculations of what the Martians actually are, who they actually are. But yeah, the War of the Worlds Martians are sufficiently alien and it doesn't fall into that Star Trek problem of they're like an eye and a, and a blob and they don't look human. They don't sound human. They don't communicate the same way. The death rays are real. They just blast you to pieces. They're scary. They're not anything of this world. So aliens, we got a bunch of options and that's what Trinity does really well. And you made mention of the fact that there is a setting secrets thing where it kind of says either this is what we intend or here's a bunch of options and holy dink, I wish that is something World of Darkness did. I think that is an interesting improvement on the future fates option where it's like, well, this is what we intend, but you could really go it in these five other ways as opposed to being like, just let the storyteller decide. Get me a list at least. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's the option paralysis that comes with a lot of that. What do I do with this? How do I use this in a game? 
you've made mention to a number of groups. Can we get a quick rundown of either of what they are or maybe some of your favorites? Yeah, I can go through who they are. If I go alphabetical, Edison's and Winers, of course, led by Thomas Edison. They're more American, the American group. So they're kind of, they're capitalists. I just have to say it that way. So they're also very classist. So you have to have money. You have to be deemed worthy. You have to buy into the organization. And then you're basically uh, policing how other people conduct their research. And when you think it's too dangerous, you take it from them. So how do you do that? Well, you, you spy on them and you steal it. Or you come in, and you clean up their messes. So it's more of an, you could think of it as like an accountability group, or you can think of them as like, they do a lot of corporate espionage. You can call call them as like thieves, however you want. You could also, you can come at, at a side, from the side that they're completely wrong in what they're doing. It's kind of, sh- kind of shitty to take stuff away from people or deny people the access to technology that could make their lives better without putting a price tag in front of it. Like, should medicine be free? Should certain devices be free if it makes everyone's lives easier? So you, it's dealing with those sorts of issues that you can write into a game pretty easily. And the thing I like about these groups are if you want to run a game that is not just the traditions, they give you a, or, or the traditional factions in the Ascension Conflict, they give you groups to glom onto if you would like to change the notion of what the Ascension War looks like. So like Edison's Unwinders are this fascinating combination of what if the Syndicate and the New World Order were chrononauts? If you need more than that sentence to run with as an idea, I can't help you. And there's a whole bunch of these. Again, there's a lot, so let's keep it moving. What's uh, what's the next one of note? So the next one is Esoteric Order of Aeons, which preludes the Aeon Society in later games. And basically, they are a... So they started as like the Esoteric Egyptian Explorer Society. In Victorian times, wealthy women used to keep themselves occupied by funding expeditions into Egypt. That was totally a thing. And they would get together. It would be like a book club. And they talk about what happened on their dig and they show off their stuff. They do it as like art exhibitions and stuff like that. So they would discuss what they found and stuff like that. So that's how a lot of that early stuff happened. And uh, and then they started to see when, when Aether was discovered, there was all this interesting and new things happening. And they decided they wanted to document it. But they're also about when you find this stuff or you invent this technology, using it in an ethical way. So they want to share the knowledge with the world. If something can help people's lives, why keep it a secret? So they're around to document things. So they get into things. They're like the combat camera. They are the wartime correspondent. And they're very much about using their money to try helping society up. We have this hermetic Akashic hollower angle on this that just kind of has this punk Hippolyta angle to it. If you are tired of dealing with the same factions in Mage, we got options. What's next? Her Royal Highness's Planetary Defensive Pact. So this is a military group. It's a British military group that is geared towards protection of the planet. You know, vigilance beneath unconquered skies. They are still very elitist. So it's very hard to, to buy in, to get into a higher level of stuff. And the it's dangerous. It's like they were formed off the aspect that Martians are invading. It's real. And we don't have the technology, equipment, or the knowledge to fight them. How do we protect the city from being raised to the ground by these monolithic things? Or how do we stop this rampant serial killer that bullets will not stop? This guy rips us apart. How do we stop that from happening? They're that group that's there to be that line of defense against these threats. So like, they're very concerned about how to detect when the Martians are coming. How are they coming? How can we get there? So logistics is a very serious issue for them. They need to be able to preemptively detect when the Martians are coming. When are they invading? Because you don't want to be there two hours later, two days later, a week later, the Martians drop down and they open fire, they capture people, and it's over. So they're very much geared towards survival. So being in HRH, it's a little bit fatalist because it's like, it isn't all, it can be very wondrous, but you're also going there with the knowledge that you might die. So they're a little bit grimmer because it's like, they're fighting against a thing that that wants to kill you. It's like, it's going to kill you or it's going to eat. It's going to kill you. It's going to capture you. It's going to do weird stuff to you. And you don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen to your neighbors or your friends or your family. So you you join them knowing that it's dangerous because you want either want the glory or you actually want to help people. We got the void engine. We got the void engine seers. Uh, so are there uh, two or three more that kind of leapt out at you? Because it's a long list and it's great in the same way that Victorian mage had a whole bunch of societies. 
Oh yeah, the Society for the Opposition of Monsters I've talked about a little bit, where it's led by Mina Harker, Luke Murray. They're fighting against monsters. They're pretty much the specialists. They think about it like the students of Tesla. They're the ones that are doing the unbridled spirit of invention and creation and research. There's this aether. How do we use it? Let's find out about. Let's let's see how far we can go. And then when things are too dangerous, they lock it away. And then they have to deal with that sort of problem, like people trying to steal it. Then like the last major society is the three prongs which is a Calcutta-based society that's actually religious. They feel that Aether is sh shiki. It's that spiritual energy that they've been using and believing in to fuel their practices for years, for generations. And they worship Kali, and they feel that transitioning from human to Magog is a natural process of order of the universe because tr they believe in tr their religious beliefs are all about transcendence. You go from being a person to being enlightened, and then you free yourself from the cycle of, of Mushka. You, be, you free yourself from the cycle of incarnation, you know, death and rebirth, and then you ascend to a higher plane to be with the gods. So they're very much a religious order, So, but they're also under occupation by the British government. They're mm -hmm. under the British Raj. They're colonialized. They have to deal with the religious practices, trying to deal with their own religious enlightenment, and then like the colonization thing. How can we use our abilities? Their temple is built on top of something to keep something sealed inside that they think that fell from the sky. It's an alien, It's an evil entity from space that people have just decreed that this needs to be sealed. So what happens if people, someone tries to open it? Is it nothing? What is inside of it? What if it's God? What if it's an angel? We don't know. So it's like that sort of thing. So that's more of your, you want to go for Chakravati or you want to go for Akashic. Those are options for that if you want that sort of parallel. They're a little bit grimmer. Their motto is uh, carry death and life to know life and death. It has big Itarajana vibes as well. The organization of like death mages that join the true black hand that protect the Alaru tombs in Enoch. So j just in case you, you wanted that deep vampire end times lore to pop up as well. And then there's, then there's a whole bunch of lesser ones. As a storyteller, when you're trying to introduce these groups, what do you think kind of the important thing to pick ahead of time is? Or, or kind of what key role do you feel they play in a game? Well, it's thinking about a scenario and then thinking what the goal is. Because once you know what the thing is and what the goal is, then you can start saying why people might want it. So, like, say you are out in a field, and then someone stumbles across a hidden crypt. You know, they just kind of fall through the ground because it's rotted or whatever, and they fall and they find this thing, and it goes deeper. The crypt goes deeper. Why is it there? Who would you tell about it? Who would you tell about it if you belong to a certain group? Why would you want it? Would you tell the police? Would you tell your friends? Would you tell your call your church? And what happens when you notify those people? Who else comes and comes looking? Why? Who would be interested in a crypt? You know, health and safety. You have police. You also have religious people. Maybe it's a site of religious importance, or maybe it's just a, it's a place that you shouldn't be there because it's there's something dangerous there. So you won't know unless you investigate. So that would give reasons for unwinders to investigate. That would give a reason for three prongs to investigate. The students of Tesla. What is it? What is it? You know, can I dig around in there? Maybe the travelers, hey, is this an archaeological find? The Aeons will be there, fuck, because they want to document everything. And then the unwinders, it's like, this needs to be, people need to be kept away from this. Or the H HRF would be there because it's like, potentially aliens. Maybe the sun would show up because they're afraid it's a monster, hide, a vampire hiding in there. Uh, so going back to kind of the previous con contrivance of Aether is something that mortals are suddenly gaining access to, the key in kind of coming up with these is to figure out within the mage world or within the magical world, how do we think people would response, respond? Mm -hmm. That uh, you would have uh, some group that is trying to keep this under wraps, you have some group that is trying to promote this as wide as possible, other people are going to view it in rig religious phenomenon, other people that think that they should be the judges of what is going to be appropriate use of this degree of potentiality. Mm -hmm. They are opinions on the, on the right order of the world inflected by the world that they came from. Uh, you make mention that this is during the height of British imperialism, so that is something that we, we don't get to ignore. Another thing this game does is it posits historical figures being special and not just being bog standard mortals. What considerations do you have for a storyteller that is either thinking of introducing a very notable mortal 
or introducing that very notable mortal being a mage or being someone who is ether touched or being some or being a vampire mage has a real mixed history of this we're looking mm -hmm. at you jim morrison or alternatively the best version when isaac newton was gunned down by the euthanatoi in the 1920s this game very much tackles that head on what recommendations or notes do you have to storytellers or tables that are thinking of including historical characters and then giving them superpowers I would be very sensitive to the idea that you should not attribute real-world atrocities to the supernatural. I think it devalues the impact of what those things are. Don't attribute colonialism to the supernatural. Don't try to justify what they did. Oh, Hitler did this because demons. No, no, no. He's a shitty person. Just ex People made mistakes in real life. They did it because they wanted to, not because something was controlling them. I think that's where a lot of things fall down, where like mass atrocities or these shitty things that happened in history get written off as as being a supernatural phenomenon. So it, don't remove the culpability of those things. And think about what who the people were as people. You know, we idolize Tesla as this this big thing, but he was a real person. They have family, they have friends. So try to be sensitive to that. When you're introducing these things to your friends or your table, you need to let, remind them that this is fiction, that these things might not have happened in this way. Sometimes you need a caveat, if especially if it's a new table. You know, this is fictional, this isn't how they actually are, because people will spin off of that idea and say, believe it to be true, but if, if you do it in a convincing enough way. You have to think about these characters as people and how, who they are, what motivates them, and how they act. Because when you keep them as like a paper cutout, it won't feel real. What what happens to them won't have impact. It's a person. What is this person's motivations? Why are they doing what they're doing? Edison, we see him as super greedy, but he was trying to make a mark and build a legacy for his family. There's more human reasons about other stuff. And he was also greedy. That was also a thing there too. If you could take other people's brilliance and market it because you're better at marketing, people do that all the time. And that's not necessarily an evil thing. So you have to think about it like that. It's like, you know, if you introduce Dracula into your game, what is he there for? You can't just say, I found out that you are my blood relative. You're my great, great, great granddaughter. And now I know where you live. I'm going to go see you. I want to reconnect with my roots or my descendants, my lineage, my legacy. So building in those personal motivations that actually connect the players to the plot in a meaningful way I think is a better way of dealing with it. If you introduce these characters, what's the reason? Do you have thoughts on what I'll call the Darth Vader problem? So if we run into Sherlock Holmes, we, you have two choices. You get Sherlocked and they know everything you're going to do before you do it. Or you outsmart Sherlock Holmes, which means they are no longer Sherlock Holmes. When you run into Darth Vader in your game of Star Wars, either he tears you limb from limb or you take down Darth Vader and you're now the guy that killed Darth Vader, which doesn't seem to fit within a game. Is there any consideration towards that um, that we should be worried about? I would think that if you're introducing the character to work alongside them, unless you're talking about Moriarty and stuff like that, he gets thwarted all the time. You don't want to minimize the impact of the character and what they actually do by making it by dumbing it down enough that an intro level character can have an impact it's better for like a long-standing campaign or like i think it's more meaningful that you are investigating something with Sherlock Holmes and then you find out that the order of murder is behind this and it's their cat's paw but you don't go directly from your start point of your game to that you should be playing like 4d chess where it's like there's all these different things going around. You have to unravel it. It's a mystery. You don't want to lessen the impact of what the players can do in a game by introducing an unkillable SPC. Because these people are fallible. They are human. They've always been human for the most part, give or take. Don't quote me on that for the Magogs. Sure. But, um, but again, it's like they have motivations. They have emotions. They're not like the end-all be-all. You can show how racist classes Sherlock Holmes is if you really want. If you want a game with Sherlock Holmes, you got to think about why you're doing it. Are you collaborating with Sherlock Holmes? Do you really want your players to feel like they're the dumb cop that's just like, oh, okay, Sherlock. You know, that's a different fan fiction. You want to be the main character. You are the main character. You're the one that is doing actions that are impacting the world and changing the plot. 
you want to be the main character of the story that you're sharing with the people around you. And you don't want to take that spotlight away from your players. So if you have Sherlock Holmes in your game, maybe he's consulting with them. Maybe he gives them a fraction of advice and then he leaves. If I ha- introduce a super powerful SPC, I take them out of the picture after I introduce them. Okay, we've had our moment with Sherlock Holmes and now we got to save him. Why? He got gassed. I don't know. He's unconscious. Now we got to solve this in his place. It's that giving that moment of getting to be your hero's hero that I think is more impactful than just say, oh, Sherlock Holmes solved it for us and I was too stupid to see it. You know, it it undermines the choices and actions of the players to lean too hard on your SPC to solve things. Have the SPC there to bail their asses out when they're in trouble, but try not to take away your player's agency that way. We have talked about a bunch of things involving Aether. We have talked about a bunch of things involving Mage. As someone who wrote on this, what are you most excited to see launched into the world? I'm just happy I can talk about it (laughs) because it's like being, (laughs) you know, talking about outside of people or, you know, outside of the writing group is super exciting. And I'm really thrilled to see what people's character concepts are. A lot of people have really attached to the Magogs and the idea of personal transformation, having the ability to transform yourself in a way that you feel fits. Or, like, I'm seeing a lot of cool character concepts coming out. And a lot of people are like, oh, man, I only have this one chapter and this brief description, but I'm going to run with it. I have ideas for games. I love that. I love people saying... I really like this group and I'm going to make a character that does this because this appeals to me. I want to make a Magog Cavalier that's going to right the wrongs of the world. It's just introducing different types of stories. Or maybe someone's playing a Blood of Gog where it's a person that is, it's an addiction story. It's someone trying to overcome their demons and they're helping people that they might have previously grieved. It's apologizing to people you've wronged, going back and trying to right those wrongs, putting things right. You can't un- completely erase the impact of the events, but you can make their lives better by not being a shitty person in the present sort of thing. So there's different little moments that you can take out of it. And I really like to see- like seeing people mixing and matching and expanding on the ideas that they really that really caught them. I'm not really surprised that people have really attached to the Bagogs because they're like, oh, wow, I can play a vampire in this system? Cool. But it's like, but there's other stuff going on too. But a lot of people are really excited about the Tesla and the Explorers and all those other types of things. I have only late in my 30s realized that in every game, I am destined to play the wizard. So I identify with people who are like, oh man, I get to play a vampire. Is there anything finally in this setting that you're like, oh man, I wish we had that in Mage? Or alternatively, oh man, I hope people steal this for Mage? Well, if any of the groups end up in a mage game, I'd be really happy if people decide that they're going to pull an invention over or they like a story fragment. I'm already getting a big kick out of hearing about other people's research rabbit holes now because I mentioned something once in a, in a sentence and now they're like, Erdetzel tunnels, goblin holes, what's this? Oh my god. <laughs> what is this thing? Is this character, or people trying to figure out what characters are real, which ones are made up, and which ones are come from fiction. So like, I kind of put a mix of all of the above in there, I might have changed some first names around, but there's nods to things. So like people trying to find all the Easter eggs is really fun. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing lore deep dives. I'm not really looking forward to the inadvertent angry discourse that comes from being the game writer, but I'm kind of bracing for it. It's like I've been on the fan forums long enough to know that you're going to get flamed. <laughs> Just accept it. It's like, yes, I'm one with the fire, you know. <laughs> And if someone finds a particularly juicy bit or inspired and wants to say thank you to you, where can we find out what you're up to, Kim? Uh, Let's see. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at uh, KimGod118. My writer website is KimberlyGodwin.com or KimGodwin.com. I'm also at StudioHNH.com, which is more graphically intensive kind of bloggy site that has links to everything as long as sort of longer descriptions of uh, some of the projects I've worked on. I have a few other places too, but it gets a little silly. But So if you could just go to KimberlyGodwin.com or StudioHNH.com, you'll pretty much find all my other stuff. Thank you so much, Kim. And if you, listener, have found this interesting, please back Trinity Continuum Aether on Kickstarter until August 18th. That's a number I should have known off the top of my head. I'm bad at hosting. Um, (laughs) we're going to bring this one up so we can answer that question and not sound like a dumb, dumb. If you're hearing August 18th. Yeah. Yes. If you're hearing this before Thursday, August 18th, the Kickstarter is still ongoing until that day. If you miss it, the link in the show notes will lead you 
to the backer kit. If you support it at at least like the, the, the nickel level, you can see the manuscript preview and open it and be like, Terry and Kim, we're just making things up. Nothing is actually in here. Or more accurately, find out that um, uh, Kim's hard work and artistry has made it through to the page. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you for having me. This has been Made to the Palette Cast, where we regularly try to rewrite history, but mostly for the purposes of fixing, editing errors, or violated NDAs. Our backers in writing history include Josh Hillerup, Oracle of Channeling Ether through a 19th century Turkish samovar. Buck Gregory, Oracle of Channeling Ether through an intricate system of locks and dams. Christopher Phillips, Oracle of Channeling Ether through Ether Goggles. Mikhail, Oracle of Channeling Ether through a short length of car antenna. Jay Widener, Oracle of Channeling Ether with intricately arranged bocce ball patterns. And the Crow of Erebus, Oracle of Channeling Ether with a simple 99 cent Walmart funnel. Thank you for your support. Additionally, I'd like to thank Alex, Alexia, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Anand, Baderfi, Berto, Blaze Hibbert, Boo, Boogers, 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 Brad the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Dan Svensson, David Roy, Derek Osborne, Derek Semsek, Fragger Rock, Gargoyle Lenoir, George Lara, Guy Conan Stewart, Ia Bolt, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jeff Brin, Jenna F., John Magnuson, Jolyn Andes, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Morgan Iran. Nathan Weaver, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Puka G, Rachel Grace, Ralph Scheinhammer, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rob H., Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Our EP shout-out is to Robart the Robot, which Google informs me is also the name of a company that produces robot vacuum cleaners, one of which is named The Robart. At first, I was concerned that the show was being supported by robot vacuums who'd gain sentience, but then I thought, well, if they are legitimately earning money through vacuuming or other means to support my Patreon, they can't be all that bad. Maybe sentient robots get bored and listen to podcasts while vacuuming rather than killing all humans. Which I appreciate, but just in case, I for one welcome our new vacuum robot overlords and recommend they back at the Oracle level if they'd like to propagate their message of peace and suction to the world. If you super liked this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at Mage the Podcast at gmail.com or at Mage the Podcast on Twitter. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash Mage the Podcast. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform you're choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to Mage the Podcast.com for show notes and all of our preview shows. Now go change reality. Also, this was the first time I recorded this outro not in my home studio, and I'm pretty glad this hotel room seemingly has done an okay job. Bye!